having performed the rituals in the city of Mecca, we now move to outside Mecca. And the first place is a place called Arafah, which is a vast open field. Arafat in Arabic means to gain an understanding. So the whole idea of spending a whole day in these open fields in the desert of Arafat is to gain an understanding. It is said it is at Arafat that the first two human beings were brought down to earth. Prophet Adam and Lady Hawa, they came down at this place of Arafat. It is at Arafat also that all the prophets and all the imams have also had a presence. So Arafat is spelled A-R-A-F-A-T. The first A stands for absence. Arafat is a vast open field and it is absent of all distractions. There is no TV, no theme park, no swimming pool, no sports facilities. It's just an open field a vast desert with the most basic ablutions facilities. So when we are gathered here in a field absent of all other distractions, what are we gathered for? So the second R is giving the answer. We are gathered to rediscover. To rediscover ourselves. And it's a good idea here now for that whole day to sit down under the open sky distracted by nothing else and rediscover of all our past sins. Some people actually take a notebook and pen and write down all the various transgressions, the minor ones, the major ones. Nowadays you can take a smartphone and note down all those items, but it is rediscovering of all the transgressions we have done. And what better place than this place of Arafah devoid of all distractions to rediscover all my past transgressions. The second A stands for absolute. In Arafah we are in a state of a haram. We've got that uniform of two simple clothing with us. Our thoughts and focus on these days is absolute on Allah, on rediscovering of our past sins and of repentance. There is no other priority. The absolute focus is on these three things. The F is to forge a new relationship with Allah, to make a new relationship. At Arafah, we wipe the slate clean of all my past transgressions and with a promise to kickstart a new beginning afresh. There is no better place to do this than the place of the fields of Arafah. There is no time to do this than on this day, the day of Arafah. The next A is for the acceptance. Acceptance of my supplications, of my good points, and of hiding my bad points, and of my repentance. It is a day for supplications for this acceptance through a very famous dua, the dua Arafah, which was taught to us by Imam Hussein. And the hadith tells us that on this day, if we sincerely repent with genuine repentance, our sins shall indeed be wiped out. And there is no better time than on this day, under the open sky, for the recitation of this famous dua of Imam Hussein. The tree in Arafat is for treatment is to Allah, to ask Allah to treat me with compassion, knowing fully well I am not worthy of his mercy, knowing fully well that I am not deserving of his forgiveness, but to ask to treat me with compassion and to take me back when he finally calls me in the same state of cleanliness that I am on this day of Arafah, for that will be the acceptance of my supplications. And finally, when he treats me with compassion and he takes me back with a clean state, he should also take me back in the company of the Prophet and his household. So Arafat, therefore, the A is for the absence of distraction. The R is for the rediscovery of my transgressions. The A for the absolute focus on Allah. 
F is for forging a new relationship with Allah. A is the acceptance of my repentance. And the tree is for the treatment with compassion. Muzdalifa in English means to pause. We have now moved from the plains of Marafa. We are coming to the plains of Muzdalifa. And we'll be spending the whole night at this place. We'll be pausing at Muzdalifa for the night. Again, it's a vast open area. Together there will be about three million pilgrims. And this open field is full of small pebbles. It is at this field when Abraha, the king of Yemen, wanted to attack the Kaaba, where he came with a group of elephants. And when they passed through this desert, Allah then asked the birds, the swallows, to take little pebbles in the clothes and with those they threw them down at the elephants and it is this way the army of Abraha was defeated from actually doing any harm to the Kaaba. And this became known as the year of the elephants. It is the year in which our Prophet, His Holiness, was born. So let us look at pause therefore, P-A-U-S-E. At Arafah we noted our transgressions we reflected on the transgressions and we supplicated for our transgressions. The P in Muzdalifa is for planning. Having now done the noting and the reflecting, we now need to plan. What is my plan of action for reforming myself? I look down at the list that I wrote down at Arafah and for every item on that, I need to have a plan of action. And I have a whole night to do nothing else but to reflect what plan, what action am I going for reformation from the Hajj onwards. The A in the pause is for absorbing. When I do my planning, having reflected, I now need to know the seriousness of my plan, the gravity of my plan, in that it's not just a lip service, I'm going into a contract of this plan of action with who? I need to absorb the seriousness of my partner. In this case, I'm going into contract with my Creator, with my Allah. It's not an ordinary friend. It's not an ordinary employer. It is with my Creator. So I need to absorb the seriousness of the plan of action that I am doing. The you in the pause is for uniting myself spiritually with Allah so I can now get closer to Him. And when I say I want to unite with Allah, it means unconditional submission. No buts, no ifs, no if only this, if only that. There is no mixing or peaking of what I want to follow. I have to unify myself, I have to unite myself unconditionally, it's submitting with all the commands of Allah, the ones that I like and the ones that I don't like. The S is for selecting. What am I going to do in this whole night at Muzdalifa? Yes, I'm going to plan. But for each plan of action, I will be selecting about 70 pebbles. For each of those pebbles that I'm selecting, I am thinking, this pebble is a weapon against the devil, against the shaitan. It is my tool to fight the shaitan. It is my ritualistic tool to fight the shaitan. For each pebble that I pick, I would have a plan of action. For example, for one pebble to reduce my pomposity, for the next pebble to get rid of my rudeness, for another pebble is to now to start listening to my parents, to be good to my friends, to keep my promises. For every pebble that I pick, I will have a plan of action in my mind or I write it down. There is enough time the whole night to go through this process. Having selected my pebbles, when dawn is now cracking at the plains of Muzdalifa, I now come to the E in the pause and that is now executing. I have reflected at Arafah, I have planned at Muzdalifa. Now I need to execute this plan. At the crack of dawn, together with three million pilgrims, 
I am now going to leave the plains of Musdalifa and head towards Minna to start the execution of my plan. So the pause at Musdalifa, I use the P for planning my action plans, the A for absorbing the seriousness of my plan, the U is for uniting and bringing me closer to Allah. The S was to select ritually the weapons I'm going to use against Shaitan. And the E now is to start executing the plan as I head towards Minna. As I now head towards Minna, I will be heading towards what's called Jamarat. Prophet Ibrahim had three consecutive dreams in which Allah is communicating to him that I want you to sacrifice your son Ismail by slaughtering him for my pleasure. It is indeed a big ask. But in submitting to Allah, both the parents and the son, without any question, are now submitting to the wish of Allah. It was Prophet Ibrahim with his son Ismail when he was on his way to the slaughtering place. They passed through Minna and it was at this place at Jamarat that Shaitan came to him and he told Prophet Ibrahim, why are you listening to God? He's asked you to do the impossible, to sacrifice your only son for his pleasure. Do not do it. At this point, Allah sends the Archangel Gabriel, Jibra'il, to Prophet Ibrahim and he says ritually take seven pebbles and throw it at Shaitan to drive him away. So Prophet Ibrahim does that, but immediately as he walks forward within a short distance, Shaitan appears again and tempts Prophet Ibrahim to keep away from the sacrifice of Allah. Prophet Ibrahim again pelts him with seven stones, seven pebbles. And again, for the third time, Shaitan comes to him at this place. Therefore, this is where we now ritually come, what is called the Jamarat, where there are three wide columns symbolizing the locations where the Shaitan came to Prophet Ibrahim. And at each of these places, at each of these wide columns, will be pelting those columns with a pebble, seven pebbles, three times on three different days. And that means, therefore, we are replicating the ritual of Prophet Ibrahim. What is the spirit behind him? On the first day, we'll be hitting the first column only seven times. But the spirit behind is not just a ritual act of throwing the pebble and making sure it hits the wall. The spirit behind is that for each pebble that hits that wide column, we'll be saying, this is my weapon against you, Shaitan. For each of these hit, I am now going to demonize you. So the first D of the seven hits on the first day is to demonize the devil. We should be sure in our mind, Shaitan is not a good person. So for every pebble that we hit, we think of a way to demonize Shaitan. We can use any adjectives. So perhaps the seven adjectives would be, you are evil, you are bad, you are monstrous, you are harmful, you are vicious, you are beastly, and you are heinous. So for each of those pebbles, I am now demonizing the devil. Together with each demonizing, I bring my plan into action now. The plan that I had formulated at Musdalifa with each pebble. I demonize the devil and I say, my plan of action so that I am away from you and closer to Allah is to perform this action. So when we go in hitting the pebbles, it is a calm, slow process. It's not just a physical, hurried ritual. It's a ritual that has to be reflected upon to demonize the devil first, and then for each of those seven hits to reflect upon the plan of action. Having demonized him on the first time, the second day I go and I now try to demolish him. The second D is to demolish him. 
This time I'll do it three times at those three locations. There are three wide columns and I have to hit each of those wide columns seven times. So in total now I will have 21 hits. Seven hits from the first days, three seven hits now on the second day. And the intention now, the spirit behind it, is to demolish the devil. I have demonized him, I now want to demolish him. So for each of those 21 hits, I want to hit the devil and I want to keep him down and to bring him down. And for each of those hits, I say, I do not want your company. I want to be closer to Allah, so keep away from him. And those action plans from Muzdalifa, the 21 action plans for each of those hits, I now repeat to myself, for each of those hits, this is the plan of action to bring me closer to Allah. On the third day, having demonized, having demolished, I now do the third D, I now want to destroy him. Demonizing in itself is not enough. To demolish, to bring him down by itself is not enough. I really want to destroy him. Not, I, not only do I want to keep him down, I want to make sure he does not come up. So again, I'll be hitting those three columns, each with seven hits, another 21 hits. So in total now, I would have 49 hits, seven times seven, the seven comes in again here of those rituals, making up 49 hits. Now I'm hitting to destroy him, telling Shaitan, do not get up because I know you will come back to tempt me. This hit is not only to demonize you, to destroy you, but to demolish you so that you do not stand up and come to me again. Having now done the three Ds of demonizing, demolishing and destroying the devil, we now go to the ritual called Kurbani, which is the sacrifice. Let's put into context this ritual. Prophet Ibrahim, by his first marriage, had no child. And he kept on praying for years for a child. It is only through his second marriage through Lady Haja, that he's got his son Ismail. So to him, the son who came late in his life was very, very dear to him. But look at now, immediately after the birth of his son, Allah is going to ask him for two sacrifices. The first sacrifice is this, leave the land of Palestine where they were, and now go and emigrate to the valley of Bakka, as it was called, which is now the valley of Mecca, the city of Mecca. At that time, the valley of Bakka was uninhabited. It had no vegetation and no oases of any water. This is the sacrifice Allah was asking his prophet Ibrahim to do, to live a comfortable, developed land and go to an unknown place where there is no water and there is no food. So that was the first sacrifice that he unconditionally submitted to it. In time when Prophet Ismail had now grown up, Prophet Ibrahim is now asked for the second sacrifice, to go and sacrifice his son by slaughtering him. Now this is the second sacrifice which is the greatest sacrifice. But neither the father nor the son no, the mother is challenging the wish of Allah. They are submitting unconditionally to Allah. And as he passed through Minna, he avoids the temptation of the devil at three locations. He now comes to the place of the slaughtering. At the last minute, when he now tries to slaughter his son, God, he puts an animal, a sheep, so it is the sheep that is slaughtered. But until that last millisecond, Prophet Ibrahim, who had blindfolded himself because he could not stand the agony of seeing slaughtering his own son, did not know until the last minute when he took away his blindfold that instead of slaughtering his son, he had slaughtered a sheep. This is the sacrifice that we are now replicating on this day. So what is the spirit behind it? 
when we sacrifice, when we do the kurbani of the animal, the question we ask ourselves is this. Prophet Ibrahim was ready to perform the ultimate sacrifice for no other reason but to submit to the pleasure of Allah. The $64,000 question is this. Am I ready to submit to the will of Allah? If Allah today was to ask me to do an act for his pleasure, and if he were to ask for that ultimate sacrifice, to sacrifice my offspring, to sacrifice my family, would I be ready for it? So this is putting into context the greatest sacrifice that Ibrahim was asked for. But today, after Hajj, God is not testing us to that extreme. He's only asking us to do the mundane obligatory things. And even of those, am I answering to his call? If Hajj, the rituals of Hajj was meaningful, if the ritual of Qurbani is meaningful, that means I have got to submit to Allah, to all his commands that he's asking of me, knowing full well the commands are simply mundane commands and none of those high sacrifices that he has asked of his prophet and his imams. If I answer to those daily commands, then I have submitted to Allah and then truly the Hajj has been successful. Having now performed the ritual of Kubani, it is one last ritual that is left. And this is called the Halak, where for men it is the shaving clean of all hair on the head. And this will be the last ritual to complete all the rituals of Hajj away from Makkah. We then need to come back to Makkah to perform another Tawaf. But at Minna, the last one is Halak. So having performed the Kurbani, we now go and clean shave the head completely. The ritual now is to clean shave the head, is to wipe away all the sins, to have a clean start. And the spirit behind is, is for all that hair that we have on our head, they're representing the sins that we have accumulated so far until this day. So by shaving all the hair, we are cleansing away, we are wiping away all the sins that we have performed so far. And the cleansing has been done through the rituals in Makkah, at Arafah, at Muzdalifah, at Jamarat, and now at Minna. But this shaving of hair in Hajj is done only once. But we all know that hair will grow back. Therefore, the spirit behind the Halak at Hajj is that after Hajj, as the hair grows back, what does it signify? It signifies Shaitan has come back. I have tried to demolish him, but probably I've been unsuccessful. As naturally as my hair grows back, the devil will be back to tempt me because he has promised Allah, I will tempt your beings from the time they are born to the seconds before their death. So that promise is there. The hair will come back, and that means shaitan is coming back. But after Hajj, when we come back, as our hair grows, we again shave and trim our hair. We may not shave it completely, but we trim our hair. So the spirit is, as we trim our hair, we think back on that day of Eid, on the day of Eid al-Hajj at Minna, when we shaved clean the head. As we trim the hair, we're trimming away the shaitan. In other words, we are demolishing him away and keeping him down. As the hair grows, as we trim it, as shaitan tempts me, I try and keep away from him, and I also try and keep away from his temptations. Therefore, the spirit of Hajj remains with me until my dying moments, where every time I trim my hair to a stylist, to a barber, every time I do that, the spirit is I demolish shaitan and try and to keep away from his temptations. And those are the rituals of Hajj that we perform at Makkah, at Arafah, 
et muzdalifa et minna. And as we have seen, behind each ritual, there is a spirit behind it. And the rituals, the hajj, become complete when the two go together. For every ritual to concentrate my mind, there is the spirit behind it. When I understand the spirit behind each of these ritual, the hajj is much more meaningful. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Yeah.